This episode is intended to be viewed in conjunction with Season 1, Episode 2, entitled, Plato the Magician? Owing to the important significance of this particular aspect of Plato's work, this episode was produced rather than attempting to fit it all into one episode. I'm Ike Baker, and this is Arcanum. In Book 10 of the Republic, Plato, by way of his former teacher and chief protagonist of his dialogues, Socrates, recounts a story of the transmigration of a human soul to a realm beyond the Ogdoad, or realm of the fixed stars, then conceptualized as the outermost shell of the material universe. The story is his retelling of what is essentially an ancient, near-death experience originally purported to have been undergone by an ancient soldier named Ur. After being found dead, his body decaying, and then brought to a funeral pyre, Ur returns to the life of his body, a total of twelve days after being slain, at which point he relates his experiences of the other world. Quote, He said that when his soul left his body, he went on a journey with a great company, and that they came to a mysterious place at which there were two openings in the earth. They were near together, and over against them were two other openings in the heaven above. In the intermediate space there were judges seated, who commanded the just after they had been given judgment on them. Then he beheld and saw on one side the souls departing at either opening of heaven and earth when sentence had been given on them and at the two other openings other souls, some rising out of the earth dusty and worn with travel, some descending out of heaven clean and bright. This scheme of judgment and subsequent reward or punishment consisting of two opposing paths is reminiscent of the weighing of the heart ceremony of the ancient Egyptian papyrus of Ani, or the Book of Going Forth by Day, formerly known most popularly as the Egyptian Book of the Dead. In the Egyptian conception, 42 judges, or assessors, were present, to whom the individual soul, or Ba, had to give a confession or account of their life in the material. The story continues, They went forth with gladness to the meadow, where they encamped as at a festival. And those who knew one another embraced and conversed, the souls which came from the earth curiously inquiring about the things from above, and the souls which came from heaven about things beneath. And they told one another of what had happened by the way, those from below weeping and sorrowing at the remembrance of the things which they had endured and seen in their journey beneath the earth. Now the journey lasts a thousand years. While those from above were describing heavenly delights and visions of inconceivable beauty. Essentially, Plato is here describing something akin to a metaphysical waypoint or travel hub where souls transmigrating from Earth, those ascending from a kind of purgatorial expiation for past deeds, and those descending from a super-celestial realm on their way to the metempsychosis, a Greek term basically synonymous with our modern idea of reincarnation, meet for a period of interface with one another, assessment of things past, and ultimately a determining of their various futures. According to Plato, Ur relates his glimpse of cosmic or divine justice thusly. For every wrong which they had done to anyone, they suffered tenfold, and the rewards of beneficence and justice and holiness were in the same proportion. Plato also relates that Ur witnesses something of singular significance, the karmic mechanism of creation that which binds souls to physical bodies, as well as binding all material form together, the spindle of the youngest of the three fates of Greek mythology, Clotho. He calls it the spindle of necessity. 
After seven days of resting in the meadow encampment, the party of traveling souls moves onward, four days after which, quote, they could see from above a line of light, straight as a column, extending right through the whole heaven and through the earth, in color resembling the rainbow, only brighter and purer. For this is the belt of heaven and holds together the circle of the universe. From these ends is extended the spindle of necessity on which all the revolutions turn. The word most often translated as necessity is the Greek anarche, meaning constraint. The Egyptian ba, or soul, was typically symbolized as a bird with a human head. This is what left the physical body after death and ascended, flew to the heavenly realms. We see in these symbolic choices, names and images, a clue to the belief that the soul is far-wandering, yet upon material incarnation it is bound, as it were, confined to a narrow place, an individual body, in a particular place, at a particular time. Plato goes on to delineate Ur's description of the heavenly spheres, which he says number eight in total, like vessels which fit into one another. He goes on to give a description of these concentric nested bowls, or whorls as they are described, which includes the following. The first and outermost whorl has the broadest rim and is spangled. The seventh is the brightest. The eighth colored by the reflected light of the seventh. The second and fifth are in color like one another and yellower than the preceding. The third has the whitest light. The fourth is reddish. The sixth is in whiteness second. This somewhat cryptic description is, upon a closer examination, obviously referring to the seven classical planets of antiquity. Quote, On the upper surface of each circle is a siren, who goes round with them, hymning a single tone or note. The eight together form one harmony. We see here an allusion to what for centuries afterward Astronomers, mathematicians, philosophers, and initiates of many traditions would refer to as the harmony of the spheres. Next, Ur beholds a glimpse of the three fates, daughters of necessity. Lachesis, Clotho, and Atropos. Lachesis, whose name meant literally disposer of lots, and whose job it was to measure the length of each thread spun. Clotho, whose name literally meant to spin, and whose job it was to spin the thread of a human life. And Atropos, whose name meant literally without turn, or in other words, unalterable, whose job it was to cut the thread. Passing first to Lachesis, the party of travelers are addressed by an interpreter for the goddess as follows. Hear the word of Lachesis, the daughter of Anarche, mortal souls, Behold a new cycle of life and mortality. Your genius will not be allotted to you, but you will choose your genius. And let him who draws the first lot have the first choice. And the life which he chooses shall be his destiny. Virtue is free, and as a man honors or dishonors her, he will have more or less of her. The responsibility is with the chooser. God is justified. The word here translated as genius is the Greek word daimon, meaning the one who divides. In this instance, it signifies a guardian or guiding spirit. This word would later morph into the word demon, which has a negative connotation. In ancient Greek cosmology, there were two daimons, the agatho daimon, the beneficial or good daimon, the guide of good counsel, and the kako daimon the evil or bad diamond. We see here that the concept of an angel on one shoulder and a devil or demon on the other is an older conception than many of us might have initially supposed. At this point in the story, lots are randomly cast to the souls. All except Ur are given lots. Quote, then the interpreter placed upon the ground before them the sample of lives, and there were many more lives than the souls present, and they were of all sorts. They were lives of every animal and of man in every condition. 
There was not, however, any definite character in them, because the soul, when choosing a new life, must of necessity become different. At this point, Plato, by way of Socrates, breaks the narration to address Glaucon, the person to whom he's speaking in the dialogue, to stress the importance of all these things. Quote, let each and every one of us leave every other kind of knowledge and seek and follow one thing only, to learn and discern between good and evil, and so to choose always and everywhere the better life, as he had opportunity. A man must take with him into the world below an adamantine faith in truth and right, that there too he may be undazzled by the desire of wealth or other allurements of evil. Let him know how to choose the mean and avoid the extremes of either side, as far as possible, not only in this life, but in all that which is to come. For this is the way of happiness. After this somber exhortation to philosophy and to the good, which is the mean between the extremes, the story resumes with an analogy on fate and personal responsibility. Quote, he who had the first choice came forward and in a moment chose the greatest tyranny. His mind being darkened by folly and sensuality, he had not thought out the whole matter he chose. But when he had time to reflect and saw what was in the lot, he began to beat his breast and lament of his choice. Forgetting the proclamation of the interpreter, he accused chance and the gods and everything rather than himself. When all the souls had finally chosen their lives and diamonds, they went to Lachesis, who paired them with their chosen diamonds and sent them on to Clotho. Clotho then drew them into her spindle and the revolutions of the planets and their respective movements. When the soul and diamond were at last bound to the spindle and to each other, Clotho brought them to Atropos, who made the venture irreversible, as her name implies. This done, the party were made to enter a wasteland and to drink of the river Lethe, or forgetfulness, quote, whose waters no vessel can hold. And as each one drank, he forgot all things. Yet once again, our man Ur was prevented from drinking of the river Lethe. The last image Plato leaves us with is a thunderstorm in the middle of the following night and an earthquake, quote, and then, in an instant, they were driven upwards in all manner of ways to their birth, like shooting stars. But in what manner, or by what means, he, Ur, returned to the body, he could not say. Only in the morning, awakening suddenly, he found himself lying on the pyre. At this point, I'd like to take a minute to say something about the word myth, or mythos. The more modern conception of the word myth suggests something fanciful and of the realm of complete fantasy. However, the word was not used as such in the context of these dialogues. It meant more like story or a tale related. It is clear from multiple of Plato's dialogues that he considered myth to be a way of speaking about something that could not be spoken of in plain language. In the Timaeus, Another of Plato's dialogues, the titular character Timaeus, a Pythagorean philosopher, speaks at length about the creation of the cosmos. He begins his monologue with the following, quote, Now it is all important that the beginning of everything should be according to nature, and in speaking of the copy and the original, we may assume that words are akin to the matter which they describe. When they relate to the lasting and permanent and intelligible, they ought to be lasting and unalterable and, as far as their nature allows, irrefutable and immovable, nothing less. But when they express only the copy or likeness and not the eternal things themselves, they need only be likely and analogous to the real words. As being is to becoming, so is truth to belief. If then, Socrates, amid the many opinions about the gods and the generation of the universe, we are not able to give notions which are altogether and in every respect exact and consistent with one another, do not be surprised. Enough, if we adduce probabilities as likely as any others, for we must remember that I who am the speaker and you who are the judges 
are only mortal men, and we ought to accept the tale which is probable and inquire no further. This sounds curious to a modern mind, but by having Timaeus say this, Plato is at the outset setting and defining his terms. In attempting to speak of such things as the gods and the creation of the universe, especially bearing in mind their lack of our modern hyper-specific scientific vernacular, it is necessary to remember that words themselves will never be able to render truth as it is perceived in higher realms. Because of the illusory nature of words, being like to the material things which they describe and having only an affinity with the universals of which they themselves are only a mere and imperfect symbol. In this way, the words which we use amount to a reflection or analogy of those material things which we speak of, and therefore share one character or quality. With the line, quote, being is to becoming as truth is to belief, Plato correlates epistemology, or the theory of how we can know truth from fallacy, with ontology, or the branch of metaphysics concerned with the nature of being. Essentially, Plato, via Timaeus, says that analogies, if they are based on ideas or words similar to the universals which we attempt to describe, all of which are changing and therefore of an unreal nature except the forms themselves, then if they be like and share a character, there is some truth to be found in them. Timaeus ends his brief preface by admitting that we as humans are mortal and will obviously not be able to glean the entire truth. But as we have seen from other dialogues, Plato and Socrates are of the opinion that just because a question may not have a definitive answer does not mean that that question is not worth asking or attempting to work out philosophically. In the Phaedo, Socrates, addressing his company's doubts about various premises concerning the immortality of the soul, says, quote, I think it is fitting for a man to risk the belief, for the risk is a noble one, that this or something like this is true about our souls and their dwelling places. Socrates says that the myth, quote, would save us were we persuaded by it. We glean by these things that Plato utilized myth as a way to summarize and analogize his philosophy. Lastly, let's not forget the part that anamnesis would have played. Though we drink from the river of Lethe, forgetfulness, there is a part of us that has had experience and interface with all archetypal forms and states of being. The obvious extension is that though our recollections and communications of these transcendent eternal truths may be hazy and seen as though through a dark glass, so to speak, our intuitive understanding or knowing may be the motive factor behind these analogies, an attempt for the mind to explain what the psyche or soul knows deeply, but cannot put into words partly because those truths transcend words. All this established, let's examine how the tale of Er's near-death experience has affected the Western esoteric tradition. Firstly, we look to the Neoplatonists, primarily Porphyry and Iamblichus. In Porphyry, we find the descent of the psyche with the diamond, through the planetary spheres spoken of in Plato's dialogue as connected to Clotho's spindle of necessity. The conception we find in the myth of Er of the cosmos as nested shells or spheres is the very basis upon which the Roman astronomer, mathematician, and music theorist Claudius Ptolemy formulated his model of the universe, which became the accepted model of the cosmos for 1,500 years. Yet in Porphyry and Iamblichus, we have a working model of the descent of the soul. Having drunk of the river Lethe forgetfulness, the soul was now a blank slate. In their Neoplatonic conception, the diamond led the soul down through these spheres and at each successive sphere, representing a particular heavenly body and the fixed sphere of the stars, the blank soul was impressed and imprinted with the attributes of each planetary sphere. Porphyry called these the, quote, astral garments. Iamblichus also spoke of the diamond who conducted the soul through the spheres as its guide. In traditional Hellenistic astrology, this was a theory for how and why astrology works. 
Depending on the conditions and aspects of these planets, when a soul is brought down through the celestial spheres, typically believed to be at the prenatal syzygy, or the first full or new moon before physical birth. The soul would be imprinted with either beneficial or malefic attributes of the various planets, depending on how they were aspected to one another. It was on these foundational beliefs that Iamblichus's theurgy or God-working was erected. From this system, we have traditions such as the Aurum Solis and Astrum Sophia, which are part of what is called the Ogdoatic tradition, the eight spheres of Clotho's spindle of necessity, octo being eight in Greek. They comprise the causal or material realm of Platonic and Neoplatonic philosophy, as well as Ptolemaic cosmology and astronomy. This picture of the cosmos and the incarnating soul was also foundational to much of early Christian Gnostic cosmology and religious belief. Early Christians of the Gnostic school of thought, such as Valentinus, believed in a conception of seven heavens, outside of which was an eighth sphere, the fixed stars. While the idea of the seven classical planets correlating to the seven distinct sections of the heavens or sky has been found in many ancient cultures all the way back to the ancient Mesopotamians, the Gnostic Christians of the first few centuries CE would have likely been more influenced by the Neoplatonic conception of these ideas, not only because they were their contemporaries, but also because Hellenism as a whole had interpenetrated and permuted with the Judaism of the time forming a synthesis of Hellenistic philosophy, culture, and sciences with Hebrew religious and cosmological cultures and beliefs. This idea of traveling back up through the spheres to reach what in the Gnostic vernacular of the time was called the Pleroma, or the abode of God, the One, Tohen, was popular at this time as well. In an effort to transcend the perceived evils of material incarnation and transcend the archons, meaning rulers of the material planes, becoming liberated from the spheres of causality through which the soul initially passed on its way into incarnation. Several Gnostic schools of thought were focused on an ascent back through the spheres by way of various purifying rites, as in the case of the early Gnostic text, the Book of Jehu, an alternate rendering of yod heh vav -Heh as the Greek divine name found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, yi and its rites of baptisms. Gnosticism is a very complex and interesting subject, and I want to note that it has very little, if anything, to do with modern Gnosticism. Hellenistic and Hellenistic Judaic cosmology are so central to the study of Gnostic religious thought and practice that I'll be producing several future episodes in order to cover it in any kind of depth. In modern magic, this concept of the heavenly spheres the psyche or soul and the personal diamond comes into play in a myriad of rites, orders, and philosophies. Again, it is a central theme of modern forms of theurgy, as in the Ogdoatic traditions, as well as in forms of astrology such as Hellenistic astrology, and various operations which make use of this kind of astrological application of the descent and reascent of the soul as well as certain forms of daimonic magic, which attempt to foster a communion with the daimon under various names and conceptions. Many forms of astrological or astral magic, including that in the Picatrix, are based on this Neoplatonic cosmology and astrology, originally stemming from this work of Plato. Modern practitioners and authors have reconstructed systems of modern theurgy based on these conceptions and philosophies as well, two outstanding examples of which are Nick Farrell's Helios Unbound and Jeffrey S. Kupperman's Living Theurgy. Another practitioner who has contributed much to my own understanding of this material is author Jamie Paul Lamb. He has written extensively and eloquently on the subject, and a link to his blog is in the show notes below. Plato's work and the Neoplatonic cosmological schema are as alive in today's modern magical practice as they were in antiquity. The works of the Neoplatonists, but more especially of Plato himself, are a veritable treasure trove of occult metaphysics from which much of our theories of practical theurgy are based on today. They comprise modes of a very effective and sound ways of being in this world. Have you ever had an out-of-body experience? Is there anything else you'd like to contribute to our discussion today? Share your thoughts in the comments section below. If you've enjoyed this video, like and subscribe to my channel, and remember to turn on all notifications. Please consider contributing to the Arcanum Patreon 
for exclusive bonus videos, interviews, and tutorials, and to help me continue to produce more free content like this. Join me again in the next video, where we'll be diving deeper into the historical, theoretical, and practical sides of this and many other related topics. Thanks for watching. In Luke's.